Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your presence. Thank you, Jesus. You are risen from the dead. And because you are alive, we too can be made alive. Thank you for the ways your spirit is already moving. I pray, Lord, as we open up the scriptures now, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to receive all you have for us this day. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. 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 You may be seated, everyone. Good morning, friends. What a gift it is to worship with you. If you're new to our church, uh, my name is Rich. I serve as the lead pastor here at New Life. And at the end of our service, I'll be downstairs in the lobby area. I'd love to connect with you if this is your first time here or if we've never met before. So uh, please make your way to me and to some of our team that will be uh, in the lobby area. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, I'm so glad you all are here after um, surviving the earthquake of, uh, uh, and making it through all that. Uh, it was quite an interesting, interesting morning. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was... Uh, in the kitchen, and all of a sudden, things start shaking. I, I just knew it was a truck, you know. It was just like a, one of those big trucks, and I was like, wait a couple of seconds, and then it kept going. And then Rosie's like, this is an earthquake, man. And I'm just like, oh, no, get under the doorpost, whatever. My California friends told me to get under the doorpost there. Uh, and it's interesting because in the last couple of days, um, a bunch of folks have been emailing me around, Rich, you know, we got a solar eclipse tomorrow. We got an earthquake. Like, is Jesus, like, coming, like, tomorrow, or what's going on here? And um, I, got it. I, I got enough email. They weren't, like, dozens, but I got enough to say, you know what, let me just say two things about earthquakes and solar eclipses. Um, so let me say two things about, and the return of Jesus and all that there. <laughs> the first thing I'd say is that Jesus is returning, and his return is closer today than it was yesterday. Are you with me? I know we're getting deep here. This is really deep here. The second thing I want to say is we, we have to be really careful about making America the center of, like, end time stuff here. Like, like, if it happens here, it's like, oh, you know, there have been earthquakes all over this world for a long time and solar eclipses, and I get it's happening on the same week, but it's amazing how we could center ourselves here and determine when Jesus is coming back based on how close pain is to us. And um, America is not the center of God's plan in the world. It's not. Uh, Jesus is. <laughs> Jesus is the center. Uh, and so let's just be mindful uh, about some of that there. Uh, amen. We could go home now, right? A amen. Just with <laughs> No, you're gonna, we've got a sermon coming as well. I got a sermon. Um, also, just a quick note here. It's an unusual Sunday in that uh, at the end of our service, uh, if you are a member of our community, meaning that you've gone through the membership process over the course of our, the years, um, you have received some emails knowing that there's a voting day as it relates to uh, our new mortgage lender. And so this happens once every couple of decades. Uh, and so at the end of our service, if, you are, if you've been through the membership process and have received those emails, there is a quick vote. Some of you have done it online, but we're doing it as well in person. If you haven't already done that, uh, just stay in your seat at the end of our service. Just for a few minutes, Pastor Jackie will lead us very briefly through that particular time. Okay, uh, we are starting a new series today, uh, and this series is focusing on uh, this title. It's called Everyday Mission, Making Jesus Known. And I don't know if there's a better time to talk about what it means to be on mission than after the resurrection of Jesus. Because in the scriptures, when Jesus is risen from the dead, this is really amazing news, the best news in the world. And the first thing that people, his disciples, had to do was share it, talk about it. Something has happened in Jesus Christ, and this is worth celebrating. This is worth bearing witness about to the world around us. And so over the course of the next eight weeks, this is one of our, our values at New Life. We're gonna talk about what it means to be on mission in various ways. And so we're going to learn about the ways that God is a missionary God. God is a missionary God and invites us to be missionaries uh, in the world. We're not just called to go on just mission trips. Our life is to be a mission trip. Our entire lives are to be on mission in the name of Jesus. We're going to talk about why hospitality matters 
and what it means to invite people to our tables and what it means to feast with one another because Jesus is so much around food. If you notice Jesus in the Bible, so much of what he did was oriented around food and fellowship and the table. What does it mean for us to do that? We're going to talk about evangelism and what it means to have spoken mission, what it means to share the good news of Jesus Christ to the world around us. And for many people, this is something that you might feel intimidated about. We want to just help you to make strides in bearing witness in word and in deed about the good news of Jesus. We'll talk about justice and how that's connected to, to mission, the Holy Spirit and mission, and what it means for our workplace to be in full-time ministry in the name of Jesus on mission. And so for the next couple of months, uh, my hope is that we would, as a community, uh, learn more and more what it means to be outward-facing, to think about the world around us, so that our lives are reaching others in the name of Jesus. And our community, since 1987, has had a rich legacy of being on mission in the name of Jesus. We have been on mission serving so many people, reaching people with the gospel, and the temptation for many people, for Christians, for individuals, for church communities as a whole, is to think, oh, because our church is full, we're, we're, we're really on mission. And uh, we have to be mindful of that, that there's no point in time where God is not inviting us to continue to be on mission and as individuals and as a community together. And so we're going to look at a passage of Scripture today. Today is a, kind of a big picture overview message, and then we're going to get into some of the specifics of this in the weeks to come. But John chapter 20, if you have your Bible, your phone, your device, you can follow along there. You can follow on the screen as well. John chapter 20, beginning at verse number 19 through verse uh, 23, hear the word of the Lord. It says, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. This is right after Jesus uh, resurrected from the dead. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Think about that for a second. As the Father sends Jesus... Jesus is sending you. If you belong to Jesus Christ, if you have claimed Christ as Lord in your life, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. That's for all of us in this room here. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. We're gonna spend our time in verse 19 through about 22. And so let's pray. Uh, let's invite God to open our eyes to scripture and to the gift of this good news that he has risen from the dead and is sending us out into the world. Lord, uh, give us wisdom now and open our eyes that we would see exactly what you want us to see for our individual lives and for our lives together as a community. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. You know, every person walking on this planet has what I would call a missional gene. There's something inside every one of us that wants to get word out, especially when we have been the recipients of goodness. When we've, when we've experienced something that has brought purpose in our lives, when we've experienced something that has brought joy to our lives, it is a natural impulse that we have as human beings to be on mission, to share that with others, and to invite them into that experience. Whenever you watch a movie, if you really watch the movie and enjoyed the movie and the movie blessed you, one of the first things we do is let other people know about how good the movie was and to invite them into that experience. So much so that we get mad when people haven't seen certain movies. We can't, we can't believe, you haven't seen that yet? What's your problem? I mean, we get really passionate about movies. Or maybe you read a book and the book blessed you and it changed your life and one of the first things you do is let everyone else know, I've read this book and this book blessed me and, and you should read it too or go to a restaurant. You, have you ever been to a restaurant and it, the meal was phenomenal, it was fantastic and the first thing you had to do was let other people know, you have to try this meal. This thing was amazing. Or if your sports team wins, mine don't, but if your sports team wins <laughs> and they just, and they won the championship, whatever that feels like, uh, you, you let the world know, you celebrate, you invite them to celebrate with you. This is the impulse that's in every single human being and this is the impulse that is to shape the way we relate to others as it relates to our faith. God has been good to us in Jesus Christ. 
God has forgiven us our sins in Jesus Christ. God has made us alive in Jesus Christ. And what he invites us to do is to activate that impulse to invite others into this story, to invite others into this experience. And what God wants to do is give us a sense of urgency and joy and passion in the name of Jesus to invite others in. Now, when I became a Christian, this was exactly what I sensed as a 19-year-old. Christ had rescued my life. Jesus forgave me of my sins, gave me a purpose, and I was so on fire for Jesus. I, was, I had so much passion for Jesus, so much so I wanted every conversation that I had with someone to be about Jesus. I wanted to preach to anyone who would listen to me. I would go to the workplace and, and realize I am sent there to get people saved in the name of Jesus. And so I had great zeal, I had great passion, but it was misguided a little bit. Because so much of my zeal and my passion was oriented around arguing with people and being aggressive. Anyone know what I'm talking about? I used to believe that you, you can argue people into the kingdom of God. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, or I would be super aggressive in the name of Jesus. I would defend the name of Jesus. I would defend the scriptures. I was only Christian for like two hours, but, but I was like passionate about this. My zeal, I, I wish some of you met me when I was 19 years old, or maybe, maybe not, uh, but you would see the, how long and the way that I've come because I used to be so aggressive. If I saw something on Christian television that didn't represent Jesus in the way that I thought Jesus needed to be represented, I'd call the television show. <laughs> there were plenty of times where I saw, call this number, and I would call and say, you are not representing Jesus well. And the person would say, sir, I'm just working customer service. I never even watched the show. <laughs> you are complicit then. <laughs> lots of aggression, lots of arguments. And so that's what I thought it meant to be on mission. To debate people, to be argue, argumentative, to be aggressive, that's how they come into faith in Jesus Christ. And so my life began with great passion, great zeal, and then over the years, something began to happen. The, the pendulum started swinging to the other side. And instead of having great passion and great urgency, that stuff would begin to dissipate. Why? Because instead of finding myself among people who were not followers of Jesus, I found myself just surrounded with Christians all the time. And I found myself now going to church services all the time. And now my life was oriented around what was happening within the four walls of the church. And when I think about my own life and the journey that I've been on as it relates to sharing Christ with the world, being on mission with the world, I realize that my journey is not unique to me. That there are other ex others who have experienced something along these lines. And if I could summarize it in two ways as we look at this series, why does our missional gene inside of us uh, dissipate? Why does it go down? Really for about two reasons. Number one, we lose our passion. We lose our passion. We forget what it was like to not have Jesus in our lives. We forget the hopelessness that we had, the despair we had, the lack of joy we had. We forget that at one point there is a BC to our lives, a before Christ to our lives. Or we have restricted God's activity to a place where the place where God is truly active is what we're doing right now and we've missed out that God's greatest activity is not happening right here. That God's greatest activity is happening out there. That's happening. Now, we celebrate, brothers and sisters, what God does in this space here but we need more than a kind of temple spirituality. Now, in the Bible, the temple was the center point of God's presence. In the Old Testament, people would gather in the temple. The Spirit of God, God's presence, would be in the holies of holies. And it was believed that if you went to the temple, that's where God's activity was. God was in the temple. And that was important. And there's something unique about us coming together as the people of God. Something about God's presence in this place is really beautiful. But what we find in Jesus is that Jesus was actually the temple of God. Jesus was the meeting place between heaven and earth. And what we find is that in Jesus Christ, people were encountering the presence of God because Jesus is the true temple. Amen. But what's even more staggering about that language of temple is that God would show up in the temple in the Old Testament. Jesus was the temple of God, and yet Jesus calls his followers, scriptures calls his followers, the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is crazy. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we find this kind of language of who we are as the people of God. The Apostle Paul says it this way. He says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives within you? This is actually beautiful because God is saying you are much more than you think you are. That you are carriers, as it were, of God's presence. And what's fascinating about the life of Jesus in the scriptures is that the vast majority of Jesus' miracles did not happen inside a church setting. The vast majority of Jesus' miracles did not happen during a worship service. The vast majority of Jesus' miracles did not happen within the four walls of the synagogue or the temple. The vast majority of Jesus' miracles and activity were outside this, these walls. And what God is inviting us into is to have a, a kind of spirituality that is not just rooted in the temple, this physical space, but one that is on mission in the name of Jesus. Are you with me? And so in John 20, we begin to see the commissioning of Jesus' disciples. And my hope is that you would recognize that God is commissioning you as well, commissioning you to your neighborhood, to your family, to your workplace, that God's hand is sending you in the name of Jesus. And that's what we see in John chapter 20. Now in our text, Jesus has resurrected from the dead. He had uh, been crucified a few days before. We had celebrated this on Good Friday, taking on the sins of the world, exposing powers and principalities. The Lord Jesus was crucified, but from the disciples' perspective, this looks really bad. They're not anticipating that he's going to come back from the dead. And yet we celebrated last week the good news that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Amen. He's alive. The grave could not hold him. Death could not hold him. He's risen from the dead. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, and one of the first thing he does is he wants to find his friends. And so he, he goes back to his friends. Why does he want to find his friends? Well, you would be, it'd be interesting to see why Jesus would do this. Because when you remember the story on Good Friday, when Jesus needed his friends most, they abandoned him. When Jesus needed his friends most, they denied him. Peter said, I'll never deny you. Jesus said, brother, listen, by the time the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And that's exactly what he did. When Jesus needed his disciples most, they left him. So Jesus now looks for his friends. Jesus finds his disciples. They're hiding in a room because of fear of being persecuted or killed in the same way Jesus was. And so they're locked in the room, and the Bible says that Jesus shows up in the room. Now, this is interesting, because it says he's locked, and then he shows up. Are you with me? What's going on here? The resurrected body of Jesus is, is glorified, and so in some way, he's able to eat a meal with his disciples, and at the same time, he's able to find himself in a room through a locked door. And so he shows up to these disciples. They did not hear a knock from Jesus. He just is in the room. And what I love about that is what we begin to find in the New Testament is that Jesus shows up all over the place, which is a good word for us. Jesus is showing up everywhere, friends. The resurrected Jesus, you can't tame him. The resurrected Jesus, you can't restrict him. The resurrected Jesus will show up anywhere at any time. And so Jesus shows up. His disciples see him. And the first words that he says to his disciples are peace, peace. Now, if I'm Jesus, those are probably not the first words that I'm saying to my friends. <laughs> and if I'm the disciples, I'm afraid because I'm expecting Jesus to come down with harsh judgment. I'm expecting Jesus to walk in and say, what happened? Why'd you guys leave me like that? How could you abandon me like that? But instead, Jesus, the first words he says to them are peace, peace be with you. That's not how I would respond. When I was in seventh grade, I went to a school called IS302 in, in Brooklyn, and I got in trouble with one of the tough guys in the school. I said something I should not have said. And, um, and he was way tougher than me, but I, for whatever reason, I said something to him. A few days later, I thought he forgot about the incident, and so I'm walking with a good friend of mine, Mitchell, down the hallway, go down these stairs. He finds me, he pushes me down, and begins to choke me. This is seventh grade in bro. He begins to choke me uh, and, and with another friend. They're, they're, they're jumping me. My friend Mitchell 
Uh, haven't seen him in a long time. My friend Mitchell, as I'm, being, as I'm being choked up, he starts backing up this way like this here. And it just kind of leaves the scene. I want to tell you, when I saw Mitchell the, the next day, it was not peace, brother. Peace be with you. It was like, and the brother, I know seventh graders get jumped all the time. Let's just play some video games. It's all good. No, it was like, what happened, bro? What happened? The first words Jesus says to them are peace be with you. And what I love about that is that Jesus sees these failed disciples. He sees these disciples who have abandoned him. And the first thing Jesus does is he does not bring up their mistakes. He sends them on mission. Don't you love that? Jesus does not bring up, some of you wonder, with all my mistakes, with all my failures, my life doesn't measure up, why would God want to send me out into the world? I don't know the Bible, Pastor Rich. Why would God want to send me out into the world? I don't have my theology together. Why would God, have you, if you've seen my inconsistency, you would know that God could not use me in this world. And I want to tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ only uses people and works with people who don't have their act together. Amen. He doesn't bring up their mistakes, but he sends them on mission. And then he tells them a few words. He says, as the Father has sent me, so have I sent you. And this is the, the, really the core, the central idea that I want you to hear Because Jesus lived with a sense of urgency that the Father has sent him, that he was a sent person. If I could say it this way, wherever Jesus went, he lived like he was sent. Wherever Jesus went, he lived like he was sent. He knew that he was not just there for the sake of being there, that he had a greater purpose, that the Father had sent him. And over and over, Jesus has this sent identity. Look at these passages of Scripture throughout the Gospels where Jesus realizes, I am set, sent. He says, I have, I have to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God and other cities too, for that, is what, for that is what I was sent to do. Luke 9, then he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Are you seeing that? Just as the Father sent me, John 6, John 8, I am testifying about myself, and the Father who sent me is also testifying about me. Jesus lived with the great sense that he was sent into the world. And as the Father has sent me, he says, so have I sent you. Which means your life has great significance in this world. You have a great purpose in this world. You are called, if you are a follower of Jesus, God has sent you and is sending you into this world. There are people around you who are hurting. There are people around you who are despairing. There are people at your workplace, their neighbors on your block, their family members that you're connected to, that God is sending you to, to bring something about the presence of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the justice of God. God is sending you in this world, that you have significance, you have purpose, you have a great identity in Christ. But what this requires of us is to recognize that God is already active. God is already moving. To be on mission requires us to recognize that we are joining God in what God is already doing. We're joining God in what God is already doing. And John 5, Jesus says it this way. He says, Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. What Jesus is saying is this. The Father is always at work. And that's what he would say later. The the, the Father's always at work to this very day, and I'm also working, he would say. The Father's always at work. God is already active in your life, around you, and he invites you to join him in what he's doing. What's the practical implication of this? It's 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 a shift in our thinking. There are many times where people say, I'm starting a new job. I want to bring God to my workplace. And I get the impulse, I get the feeling, I get the sentiment. It's beautiful, but it's off. Why? Because we don't bring God anywhere. Are you with me? God's already there. There's no place where God isn't. We don't bring God anywhere. We discern where God is at work. It's very easy for Christians to carry this arrogance, I'm bringing God somewhere. I mean, this is what's behind some of the bad stuff about missions work, isn't it? And missionary work. That we believe that some place is godless, and then when we show up, that's when God shows up. I want to tell you, God's already there. Christ is already risen. 
He's already present. What we do, however, is discern the ways that God is already at work in the world. And so what we're doing, we're joining in what God is already doing. And to join in what God is already doing means that we have a particular posture towards the world, a particular way of seeing the world. This is important because when Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so have I sent you, when the Father sent Jesus, there was lots of confusion about Jesus and his ministry. They thought that when the Messiah came, that he would judge the sinner and exalt the righteous. They thought that anyone who was a sinner would be cursed by the Messiah, and the so-called righteous will be raised up. But instead of doing that, Jesus kind of flipped the script on them, didn't he? He came and blessed the sinner and rebuked the righteous who were righteous in their own eyes. He would have meals with tax collectors and sinners. He would move towards people who the world thought, these are people who you should not have any contact with whatsoever. Jesus was so close to people in the world that they accused Jesus, listen to this, of being a drunkard and a glutton. That's what they said about Jesus because of his association with with the world around him. And what this reminds me is, Jesus had a particular posture towards the world. A posture of blessing towards the world. A posture of presence towards the world. A posture that we want to move people towards God, not away from God. In that respect, then, we have to be mindful about our postures. I think if I can narrow it down, we often have three postures that get in the way of what it means to be sent in the name of Jesus to the world around us. And if I could simplify these postures, we we either have a posture that is apart from the world, above the world, or against the world. And this stands in the way of what it means to be on mission. It's so easy to be apart from the world. And I think there's some holiness traditions that believe that you you, you are not to do anything, have any kind of interaction with people who are not followers of Jesus. And this is where holiness gets it wrong. Because at the end of the day, holiness is not simply about what I separate myself from. Holiness is about what I give myself to. And it is very easy to think I need to separate myself from every person there when Jesus, in fact, said that we are to be in the world, but not of it. We are in it, but not of it. We are to enter into close proximity with the world around us while at the same time maintaining our distinctiveness. And yet it's very easy to live apart from the world where we don't have true friends who are not followers of Jesus. Where in fact, unbelievers, non-Christians are simply a transaction. I'm relating to you simply because of of a transaction. And listen, I want every person to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But do you know that people around us know when they're just a project of ours? People around us know that, oh, you're just doing your religious thing on me. You're not really here to have friendship whatsoever. And yet Jesus is known as a friend of sinners. It's very easy to be apart from the world or above the world, where we live with a sense of smug condemnation against the world. We live with a holier-than-thou perspective against the world. We see the ways that the world is caught up in sin, and instead of moving towards them in love, we move towards them with condemnation and judgment. It's very easy to be above the world or against the world. And when the church is known more about what it's against than what it's for, we're in trouble. It's very easy to say to the world, I'm against this, and I'm against that, and I'm against this, but what would it look like if the church and our individual lives would be marked by what we are for? To be apart, to be above, to be against gets in the way of mission. And what Jesus is inviting us into is the kind of life that works for the blessing of the world. And so very simply, what does it mean that God is sending us? What does it mean that God, as a community together and in our individual lives, what does it mean that he's sending us? Who is God sending us to? Throughout the course of this series, we're going to focus on really three areas of where God is sending us to. And my hope is that our eyes will be open to the ways that Christ is already at work and that we would join him for the healing and the freedom and the salvation of the world around us. 
There are three areas we're being sent, and then we're going to take communion together. The first area that God is sending us as a community and as individuals is to those nearest to us. You know, it's very easy to be on mission to folks out there and miss being on mission to those who are nearest to us. Do you know, in fact, it's actually sometimes harder to be on mission towards those who are nearest to us? See the patience you have for people who don't, you don't really know and compare that with the patience you have with people who are real, really no, next to you and close to you. Think about the kindness that you show towards people that you really don't know and then the kindness that's shown to people who are really nearest to you. God is sending us to those nearest to us. When I think about that, I think about one um, experience I had. One day I was, I, was, I was praying, I was journaling, and I wrote this in my journal. I said, Lord, I'm reminded I'm a part of a great story that's thousands of years in the making. Jesus, you are making all things new. You are restoring the world to yourself, and you are inviting me to join you in this work. And then I wrote in my journal, send me to whomever you want. You ever had those prayers? You, you, I mean, you're, you're, you're feeling like really godly. Send me, Lord. And as I was writing these prayers, I never forgot it. Karis, my, who was four years old at the time, has the nerve to interrupt me and ask me for cereal. <laughs> and I was just so bothered by this request for cereal. I'm thinking, uh, Lord, I said I want to do something significant in the world. Uh, send me to whomever you want. And she's asking for some cereal. And I saw her little distraction as an intrusion to me being on mission. And I got up, and I was all, like, mad about it, and I poured her the Cheerios and the milk, and I sat back down to, to finish my prayer time with God. <laughs> and then I felt, like, convicted by the Holy Spirit about that very moment right there. And why, what I wrote in my drone note is, Lord, I've looked at this simple request as cereal, for cereal as a distraction. And yet joining you in the restoration of the world must include pouring milk and Cheerios for a little girl. Teach me to be lovingly present to my family too. Not just out there. I want to tell you, God has sent you to those nearest to us. And it's very easy in the name of Jesus to care about people out there and forget about the people who are nearest to us. Do you know if you're married that your first mission is to your spouse and your family? To let them know that they're loved and they're lovable. Do you know that some of the greatest missional work happens with you and your roommate and the ways that you love those who are nearest to you? God is sending us, sending us to those who are nearest to us. God, secondly, throughout the series, we're going to be reminded that he's sending us to our neighbors, to our neighbors, like our literal neighbors, like the people who live next to us, neighbors. And what's interesting, in a city as crowded and as dense as ours, it's very easy to live with a sense of anonymity. We can live as perpetual strangers in the city. If we were to do a survey, we're not going to do a survey here, of like how many neighbors you really know that live on your block. I wonder what the answer would be. And not just their names, but their stories, their struggles, their hurts. To what degree are you aware of the neighbors around you? To what degree have you had meals with your neighbors? To what degree have you invited them into your home? To what degree have you been in their home? To what degree have you had conversations, not just about Jesus, but about life? And the reality is, wherever you find yourself living currently, you're not just there because it's a half a block away from the train. You're not just there because CVS is two blocks away from you. You're there because God sent you there. You're there because there are people around you who are longing for the healing touch of Jesus Christ. You're there because there are people who are hopeless and in despair. You're there to offer hospitality. You're there to be discerning about how the Spirit of God is inviting you to invite them into relationship with God. You're not just there to be there. You're there for the sake of our neighbors. And what, it, what would it say about our lives if we were begin to Love our neighbors well in the way that Jesus invites us to. God is sending you to your neighbors. And thirdly, God is sending you to your workplace. You're there in your workplace not just to get a paycheck. You're there because God has sent you there. And whether he's sending you there for the next two months or whether you're there for the next couple of decades, your life is to be a witness. You are to be salt and light 
in a world that's marked by darkness. You are to be salt and light in a world that's marked by despair and hopelessness. God is sending you to your workplace. And so, friends, here's my biggest, my biggest hope. My biggest hope is that you would recognize that you are sent. God is sending you. Wherever Jesus went, he lived like he was sent. And my hope is that we would have this same burden in our lives. And so whether you're a hairstylist, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a stay-at-home mom or dad, whether you are a teacher, everyone is in full-time ministry, and God is sending you to your workplace. Now, if I can summarize all of this, I'll summarize it in this way, and then we're going to receive communion together. That when I look at John 20, when I look at Jesus and the resurrection and Eastertide and the coming of the Holy Spirit, if I could really capture uh, what, what I've talked about here and where we're going, I'd capture it in these four statements. Number one, God has been active long before we arrive. Just get that deep down in your spirit. God is already at work long before we arrive. Number two, God doesn't use perfect people to join him on mission. God uses broken people. I'm so glad the Bible is not a book of sanitized holy people. The Bible is a book of people who keep missing the mark, and yet God still invites them to join him in the healing of the world. Number three, we must be reminded, brothers and sisters, that it is the Holy Spirit who changes lives. We are not called to be the Holy Spirit because we're not the Holy Spirit. But we are called to join in what the Holy Spirit is doing. And then lastly, we live in hope that Jesus ultimately is going to restore and renew the world. Jesus and him resurrecting from the dead, we put our trust in Jesus Christ. That all, although transformation is not happening in the way that we would want to see it, we trust that one day Jesus will make things new. And so listen, God is at work in our lives right at this very moment. And he's inviting us to join him in that. And that's one of the reasons why we, re why we receive communion. We receive communion not simply because it's a way of remembering what Christ has done. When we receive communion, it's a gesture of God's hospitality towards us. That God invites us into a meal. God invites us to share life with God. And this table here is to shape our tables in our homes and shape our tables in our workplaces and in our neighborhoods? What would it look like for us to receive communion and, and, and think to ourselves, this is not just for me. This table reminds me that God is sending me out to be a blessing to the world around me, to invite others into friendship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray together.